Okay, let's see if this is any better. Uh, it still says on my end that I'm dropping frames, um, but there's no moving part, so as long as the stream isn't buffering and you're able to hear me, then I think we'll be okay. So, uh, give me some sort of thing in chat that tells me if it's working good, uh, if everything sounds fine, you're able to hear me, um, and it's not buffering. Okay, it doesn't seem to be. That's good news. Uh, so we'll assume that it's not going to buffer from here and it's just going to work. And if it stops working for some reason, then that's fine. We'll figure out a way to deal with it. So I'll do the intro one more time, just in case this uh, you missed it. So um, today we're going to look at the structure of a Japanese sentence. Um, we're going to focus purely on the grammar side of things here. And the actual content of the sentences isn't going to matter so much. What matters is understanding how individual things can tell you what the structure of the sentence is. Japanese uses particles, so if you look for these particles, you'll be able to figure out roughly what the sentence is about. And then you can just look up the words in a dictionary or type them into the internet and find out what they mean, even if it's a word you've never seen before. Just knowing what the structure of the sentence is helps you just insert this translation of a word that you didn't know in, and then you're good to go. Uh, so in this lesson, there is no romaji, and there's often not even furigana, which is a way of using a hiragana on top of a kanji to tell you how to read that kanji. Um, that's fine, I think, because the point of these sentences is to look at the structure and not so much at the individual words within them and what the overall sentence means. I can tell you what those are, and the main thing that I want you to focus on is how there are certain indicators to tell you the structure of the sentence. That said, if you find it too difficult to follow along, let me know, and I'll adjust for the next lesson so that there's uh, more tools for you guys who are still beginning to keep up. So to start, every Japanese sentence is one of these two. Either A does B or A is B. That is the only kind of Japanese sentence at its core level that can exist. Where A is the subject, if it is an A does B sentence, then B is a verb, and so A does B would be A ga B. A would be whatever it is that the subject of the sentence, the thing that is doing the verb, and B would be your verb. So, watashi ga iku, I am going to go. So, watashi is the subject of the sentence, it is the thing or the person or the actor of the sentence, the thing that does the verb, and iku is the verb, and it is to go. So, watashi ga iku. If it's an A is B sentence, then A stays the subject, no change there. B is some kind of description about the subject of the sentence. So this could be a noun, you know, something is a particular kind of noun. It could be an adjective. So something is like this. In either case, you're going to use this structure, a, ga, b, da. So this da, it's called a copula. Um, in the formal version, this is this. Uh, and this just tells you that this is a noun or an adjective. So, if you look at this sentence, we say Rushia is the subject and Nihonjin is the description about the subject. So, Rushia ga Nihonjin da. Okay, Rushia is a Japanese person. So, this da at the end, um, it's basically required when a, the end of your sentence, you have an A is B sentence, not an A does B, but an A is B sentence. 
uh, then if it's a noun, you're going to require ta. E adjectives, so true adjectives, right? Um, these are adjectives in the Japanese language. They're not converted words that are used like adjectives, but these are just true adjectives that have no other meaning. Those implicitly contain ta, so you don't need ta at the end of your sentence. Uh, and so if you look at this example sentence, which is kuruma, car, ga, akai, you don't need da at the end because akai is an adjective. It's an e adjective, um, which uh, from here I'm going to call e adjectives as adjectives and I'm going to call na adjectives as nominal adjectives or adjectivized nouns. So kuruma ga akai. There's no need for da or this at the end of this sentence. Uh, conversely, if you had a noun, like we had Nihonjin here, this is a noun, Japanese person, then you require ta. And if you had an adjective like suki, which is not an e adjective, um, it's just um, a noun that has been turned into an adjective, then rushia ga suki ta is how you'd have to say it. Japanese sentences don't have to explicitly state the subject of the sentence if it's understood from context. So if you look at this pair of sentences, you have A does B, then A does C. You don't need to say A does the second time. You can say A does B, then C. Similarly, if it's an A is B sentence, A is B and also A is C, you don't need to state it again. And you can just say A is B and also C. So this invisible pronoun, it's kind of like John Cena. It's there, but you won't necessarily see it all the time. So if we're talking about John Cena, you don't have to say kare ga John Cena da. You can just say John Cena da. You don't have to state the subject of your sentence if it's understood from context. In this case, you would be pointing at John Cena, or at least the space that you assume John Cena is in because he's invisible, and you would say John Cena da, as in that's John Cena. But you don't have to say that's John Cena. This is equivalent to just pointing at John Cena and saying John Cena. Next, we can learn this particle O. O marks the object of the sentence. So this is the thing that the verb is done to. So A is our subject, which we already know. That's the thing that does the verb. B is the verb. Then C is what A does the verb to or on. So in this sentence, I have watashi ga niku o taberu. So watashi is me. Niku is meat and taberu is eat. So watashi ga niku o taberu. So if we ignore this part, the base sentence is watashi ga taberu, I eat. And then we can add some context to the sentence with niku o taberu to say I eat the meat. And, as before, you can drop the subject if it's obvious. So, rather than saying, watashi ga niku o taberu, if it's understood that I'm talking about myself, I can just say, niku o taberu. So, the underlying structure, this a ga b, remains throughout. Zero ga taberu. But you don't say zero ga. You don't have to say that. It's understood from the context of this sentence that I am the one that is eating or will eat. And it is niku o taberu, which is the important part of the sentence, which is saying that I will eat meat. Another particle we can learn is ni. Ni marks the target of an action that we're going to do. So in this case, if we say 
A is the subject and B is the verb, D is the target of the verb. In this case, watashi ga nihon ni iku is I will go to Japan. So nihon is Japan, nihon ni iku becomes go to Japan and watashi ga I Japan to go is the structure of the sentence. And again, if you didn't have this, it's just watashi ga iku, I am going, which is the core part of the sentence. And it's just nihon ni iku, which is adding some information to this sentence, modifying the verb iku, giving it some more context. And as before, your subject can be zero, the invisible pronoun, and so you don't have to say it, in which case it's just Zero ga nihon ni iku, which is nihon ni iku. So this is always present, the zero ga. If you don't have an explicitly stated subject, there is the implicitly stated zero ga and the rest of your sentence. You just don't have to say it. But it's always there. So when you're trying to make sense of a Japanese sentence, it look for the ga and see if there is something marked with ga that is typically your subject and then you look for these particles like ni and o and those tell you what is happening within the sentence. So putting these together we can form the logical trio. All right, These are all logical particles so um, there's ga which marks the subject, there is o which marks the object and there is ni which marks the target of an action. So all of those together watashi ga boru o anata ni nageru. Watashi is me, boru is just ball, anata is you and nageru is to throw. So watashi ga, I am the subject, boru o, ball is the object, anata ni, you are the target and nageru is the action to throw. So, watashi ga boru o anata ni nageru. I will throw the ball to you. Now, what's interesting about Japanese sentences is that the order of these individual elements within the sentence does not really matter. Um, at least the last part does have to be the action B but the parts before it can be kind of rearranged and it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. This is different from English. In English, you have to order things in a specific way in order for the sentence to make sense. You can't jumble words around. But because you have particles which are conveying what a individual word or a group of words is doing in the sentence, its role in the sentence, you can kind of lift those out as blocks and rearrange them and it's still fine. So if I say watashi ga boru o anata ni nageru or I say anata ni watashi ga boru o nageru they both mean the same thing. Watashi ga is a block which says I is the subject. Boru o is a block that says the ball is the object and anata ni is a block that says anata is the target. So if we look, we see anata ni present, watashi ga is present, and boru o is present. The order can be mixed up, that's fine. But all these blocks, as long as they're present individually, then that's fine. And they both mean the same thing, I throw the ball to you. So having talked about the logical particles, we can talk about a non-logical particle. This one is wa. So wa, as we talked about yesterday, is a topic marker. It's not part of the logic, the structure of the sentence. So if you mark something with wa, then it should be possible for you to drop it from the sentence and still understand what the sentence means. I'll give you an example. So the way to use wa is you mark the topic such as kyo wa, kyo means today. So kyo wa, speaking of today, 
and then you have the rest of your actual sentence which uses a ga b structure so kyo wa watashi ga boru o anata ni nageru ashita wa anata ga boru o watashi ni nageru so what we've done here we're saying today kyo wa for today watashi ga i anata ni to you boru o nageru i'll throw the ball to you i will throw the ball to you ashita wa tomorrow anata ga you watashi ni to me boru o nageru throw the ball to me so just by changing the order of these particles we change the meaning of the sentence right so you change the subject in the second sentence you made it anata ga and watashi ni and by changing these uh, particles you change the subject and the target of the action but the structure of the sentence does not rely on this part the logic of the sentence isn't changed it's i throw the ball to you and then you throw the ball to me and the wa marked today and tomorrow are just when when we're talking about today i'll throw the ball to you but when it comes to tomorrow you can throw it to me now assuming that the subject or the object or the target is understood from context you can drop it so instead of saying kyo wa watashi ga boru o anata ni nageru because it's understood that you're going to throw a ball if it's in your hand and you're saying here i'm going to throw this to you you don't have to say i'm going to throw the ball to you you're just going i'm going to throw it and then you don't have to say watashi ga because you're the one holding the ball so it's obvious you're going to throw it so you don't need that either so you can drop all of this from your sentence it's implicitly present in the structure of the sentence but it's not being said out loud and so you can just say kyo wa anata ni nageru which is today throw to you ashita wa watashi ni nageru tomorrow throw to me and immediately it's understood uh, who is going to throw to me well you're going to throw to me because i'm telling you and what are you going to throw the ball because i'm probably holding it up in my hand or we were talking about a ball and so it's just understood that you'll throw the ball so today throw to you tomorrow throw to me this is how japanese sentences tend to work information that is implicit is not often stated because that's the efficiency of the language which japanese prefers as an expression strategy it wants to use as few words as possible to get an idea across so reduplicating ideas being redundant is not considered useful so it's often dropped this doesn't mean that this information isn't present it is not wrong to state it right the sentence still makes grammatical sense it's just that a native speaker will probably not do that so you can use wa with the subject or the object and not change the meaning of the sentence all that's changing is the emphasis this is kind of what i hinted at with wa versus ga right if you say watashi wa boru o anata ni nageru or you don't even say boru o and you just say watashi wa anata ni nageru then you're saying i will throw the ball to you if you say boru wa anata ni nageru then it's now talking about the ball i'll throw it to you so in the first sentence watashi wa anata ni nageru you're saying that speaking about me i'm going to throw the ball to you so then a subsequent sentence after that is still going to be about me the second sentence is boru wa so you make the ball the topic and then your second sentence after that will be about the ball most likely so removing the implied parts watashi wa anata ni nageru and boru wa anata ni nageru changes the topic it is i throw the ball or i throw the ball to you english has stress accents and stress patterns that you can use to apply emphasis a japanese doesn't have stress accents and stress emphasis 
So it uses these particles to imply where the emphasis is. So in this case, using wa rather than ga emphasizes what is the main thing that you're talking about. In this case, in the first sentence, it is I am the topic. So talking about me, this is what I'm going to do. In the second case, it's like talking about the ball. This is what's going to happen to the ball, which is I'll throw it to you. So moving to the next concept, we have time expressions. Time expressions would be something like saying at two o'clock or on January the 7th, something like that. That you can call it a time expression. It's you're talking about the time. These work just like they do in English. So if it is a relative time, so tomorrow, six days from now, something like that, then you don't need any kind of special marker. But if it's an absolute time at 6.30 on December the 25th, then you need, like you have a preposition in English, a marker. In this case, it's ni. This is not the same ni as the target, which does get a little confusing. This is a time marker. So if you have a relative time expression like tonight, which is konya, then you can just say konya nihongo o benkyo suru. Nihongo is Japanese language. Benkyo is a verb, or sorry, benkyo is a noun, which means studies. And suru is a verb that lets you turn a noun into a verb. It's like okay, saying, I will do study. So I will study. So here you can just say konya nihongo o benkyo suru. O marking the object, which is Nihongo, so you're going to study Japanese. But if it's an absolute time, then Kyuji ni at nine o'clock, at nine o'clock, Nihongo o benkyo suru. I will study Japanese at 9 p.m. Okay. So now let's talk about adjectives. There's a few different ways to make adjectives in Japanese. Um, the first is what I called an E adjective, right? So these are pure adjectives that are an adjective no matter what, like akai, which is red. So in these cases, you can have the adjective at the end, pen ga akai, right? So if you say the pen is red, then using it as an adjective, akai pen, and then the rest of your sentence, right? So it is a true adjective. You can lift it and move it here. No modification needed. You can also have verbs be an adjective in a way. It's kind of like the girl who is singing, right? So the singing girl. So if you took the sentence, shoujo ga utatta, the girl was singing. Then you can move this verb again the same way to the beginning of the sentence. And utatta shoujo, the girl who was singing, and the rest of your sentence. So you can turn verbs into adjectives as well. You can turn nouns into adjectives. This is how that works. Hana ga kirei da. Hana is flower. Kirei is pretty, which I know that sounds weird. Pretty is an adjective in English, but a lot of words, when they were ported from Chinese into Japanese, they got ported as they are, as nouns, even if they were adjectives in Chinese. Uh, the same thing happens with words from other languages. So even English words get ported in as nouns, as they are, even if the word is an adjective or a verb in its original language. So, Hanaga kirei da. You need da in this case, as we talked about, because this is an A is B sentence, and kirei is not an E adjective, it's a noun. When you want to turn that into an adjective, this da, it has to kind of be there, so it changes into the connective form, which is na, and then you get kirei na hana. Okay? So now instead of saying the flower is pretty, you're saying pretty is flower, 
and then whatever it is you're about to say. Which with pretty feels a little weird because it's an adjective. But if you were to assume a sentence like Rushia ga nihonjin da, right? Rushia is a Japanese person, then it would be Japanese person is Rushia and then whatever it is. So the, the Japanese person Rushia requires you to change that da at the end to a na to use it as an adjective. And then the last way you can make an adjective is to say that something belongs to a group of things. So when you say kuruma ga pink da, right, then you can change it to say pink no kuruma. So instead of pink na kuruma, uh, by saying pink no kuruma, you're saying that uh, of all the pink things, the car, which is pink. So these na and no adjectives, we'll talk a little bit later about how exactly they would work and what the differences are between them and why would you use them. E adjectives are true adjectives and you can also move verbs to make adjectives out of them. If you wanted to negate something, you do this with nai, which is like English not. And it works like an adjective. It's not an adjective, but it works like an adjective. So, nai is the negative form of the verb aru, which is to be. And so, nai is to not be. So, pen ga aru, if there is a pen, becomes pen ga nai, if there is not a pen. Uh, and then this nai gets lifted and used all over Japanese as a way of saying not. So while English requires you the, to use the verb and you have to say there is not a pen, so there is no pen, uh, in Japanese you don't specifically have to say that. You just say pen is pen not. And so nai on its own is a state of not being. So if you wanted to negate a sentence saying kore wa pen da, right, this is a pen, then it would become kore wa pen de wa nai. Okay? Let's look at this bit by bit. So kore wa, speaking of this, and now we've established the topic, zero ka, because every sentence has a subject and we just don't mention it in this case because it is the same thing as the topic. We said, Speaking of this, this is pen dewa. As for a pen, nai. No, it's not a pen. So the zero ga, we don't talk about it. But if you look at this translation in English, it is speaking of this. As for is it a pen? No, it's not. So rewriting that sentence in a way that makes sense in English, it's like, as for this, a pen, it is not. Which is not how you would normally say the sentence in English, but it conveys the idea of the structure of the Japanese sentence as closely as I could get it. Uh, pen da changes to pen de, which is te form, so the connective form of it. And, and so you have this da at the end, and you're trying to continue the sentence. So you change it to te. Don't worry about that. We'll talk about te form later and then it'll make sense. The reason I tell you though that it is dewa is because most of the time dewa is going to change to ja. It's a contraction. The same way that cannot becomes can't, dewa becomes ja. And sore wa, or sorry, kore wa pen da becomes kore wa pen ja nai. It's the same sentence, kore wa pen de wa nai. It just becomes kore wa pen janai. And so a lot of times people will tell you that janai is how you negate something. That's not quite true. And this is why I wanted to tell you how it comes from dewa, even if you don't understand de yet. Okay? So to say that a noun is something, kore wa pen da, to say it's not something, kore wa pen janai. Okay, let's talk about verbs because we kind of ignored them before. 
So the way that verbs work in Japanese is there are two kinds of verbs. There are ichidan and kodan verbs. Ichi, you remember, means one. And kodan means five. Conveniently, if you look at the list of vowels that you have in Japanese, a, i, u, e, o, we have five of them. There's a reason for that. Why are these called kodan? Godan means five kinds. So if a verb is a godan verb, uh, then it's going to use all five of these in certain contexts. If it's an ichidan verb, then it's not going to use this pattern that I'm showing you. And it's always going to have the same look in all of them. So verbs by default are in U form. So they end in an U sound. It could be U, Ku, Su, Tsu, Nu, Bu, Mu, Ru. And I have examples for all of them. You have Kau, which is to buy, Kiku, to hear, Hanasu, to talk, Motsu, to carry, Shinu, to die, Tobu, to jump or fly, Nomu, to drink, and Toru, to take. Again, you don't have to know what these verbs mean, but the point is, in their plain dictionary form, the base form of a verb, they always end in an U sound. You conjugate a verb, and I don't want to really say conjugate, but it's the best choice here. Um, so when you are changing a verb into a different form, and you want to use it in some way, uh, you change the last character based on whatever it was to a corresponding syllable in the same row. So, u will change to e when you end the verb with one of these forms. If it is a godan verb, so it is one of those five type verbs. If it's a one type verb, so I call them iru eru verbs because ichidan, godan doesn't really make sense, but iru eru does because they tend to end with iru or eru. Then you just drop the ru and you always have this one form. So taberu is an example of this. It's an iru eru verb. And you just drop the ru and it is tabe and whatever after that. For all verbs, you just add whatever it is if it's of one type. If it's a five type, you have to care about which ending you get. So, within these, you would use E form, and I'll have examples, if you're being polite, so then you add the mas helper verb. You want to say that you want something, so you use the ending tai. You want to say it seems like this, so you would use the ending so, or if you wanted to add a noun after it, you know, some kind of like modified verb noun. So for example, mono, which is thing, or kata, which is type. So something mono, if you had a verb, would be a thing that you do this with, or something kata would be the way that you do this. I'll have an example. So mass form, this is polite form. So if you say omo, this is a verb which means to think. In polite form, the u will change to e, right? It will shift this way, and then you add your stem. So omo e mas becomes the polite form. So the sentence kyo wa suisei ga kawaii to omoimasu. Kyo wa, speaking of today, suisei ga suisei is the subject, kawaii. To is like a quote particle, so it just kind of puts this. Omoimasu. So I think that suisei is cute today. Tai, you can change nomu, which is to drink. Again, it will become mu, will change to mi, no mi, and tai, I want to drink. So again, these sentences, not so important. This one says, Hatsune miku no yasai juzu ga nomitai. Hatsune miku no yasai juzu. Yasai is vegetables. Hatsune miku is a person. So, Hatsune miku's vegetable juice. Ka, that's the subject. No mitai. I want to drink Hatsune miku's vegetable juice. 
So, so you have furu, which is like rain to fall. Furiso, it seems like it will fall. So, ashita ame ga furiso. Ame is rain. So, ashita ame ga furiso. It looks like it's going to rain tomorrow. Or if you had a noun like kata, which is way, so hanasu is talk, hanashi kata is way of talking. Pekara no hanashi kata, the way pekara talks, ka daisuki da, I really like it. Kawaii janai, isn't it cute? Now we'll talk about this janai being used as a negative with a question later. Similarly, verbs can change to a form. This would be if you were negating them, if you are negating them in an old-fashioned way, and then passive and causative forms, which we will talk about in the future. But it's the same idea. Kau will become kawanai. Uh, this is because of that merging of the fu and ha and wa sounds, but it's the only exception. U will change to wa, but every other time you will get kika nai or hanasa nai, mota nai. Shinanai and so on. So, Hachama no tanjobi gutsu o kawanakatta. This nakatta just makes it past tense. Again, I'll talk about that. So, Hachama's birthday merchandise, gutsu is merchandise. So, Hachama's birthday merchandise o, this is the stuff that the verb acts on, and the verb is kawanai, which is didn't buy. And then kata is just a suffix that makes it past tense. Same thing in archaic form, omou, the u will change to wa, so omowazu, and a sentence. You have the reru form, you have the seru form. We can skip those for now because we'll talk about them in detail later. Uh, there's e, which is the imperative form. Uh, but also for the potential form, you would use e. And so, kaeru is can buy, kikeru is can hear, and so on. Uh, in a form, this is imperative. So, this is telling someone to do something. So, tobu, which is to jump, becomes tobe. And it's telling someone, jump. So, in the song, tobe, fly high, it's saying, jump, fly high. And there's the O form, which you can add U and it becomes volitional. Again, we'll cover all these different verb forms later. So, Iku would become Iko, and then Rainen Tokyo ni Iko is next year, let us go to Tokyo. Okay. So, this is how verbs generally work, is they're going to look if they're a Godan verb, or a, what I call a regular verb, then you're going to change the last sound at the end of the word into the form that you need based on the ending that you're going to attach to it. And if it is an iru eru verb, so, you know, this ichidan verb, it has only one form, then you always drop ru, you have this ending, the ending does not change, and you just add whatever it is at the end. So, for example, if we go back and we say nai, right? Did not eat, taberu, drop the ru, tabe nai. Want to be polite, mas, drop the ru, tabe mas. No change. But if it was, you know, hanasu, which is to talk, in polite form, su changes to shi and becomes hanashimas. Um, or if you want to negate it, then it changes to a and hanasanai. Same thing happens with tsu becomes chi. So motsu would become mochimas and mochitai. I want to carry something and so on. So even when you have these unique pronunciations like shi and chi and tsu, they are still part of the same set. And so things will go through this transformation. So uh, how do you know if a verb is ichidan or godan? How do you know if it is one of these verbs that transforms or not? The trick is in the dictionary form, 
is it kanji plus one character? If it's kanji plus one character, most of the time, you can look at the last character. As long as it is not Ru, it's a Godan verb. If it is Ru, right, like Toru, if it's just Ru and no other characters, it's still a Godan verb. The only time is when you get something like Taberu, where there is some kind of a thing before the Ru, then you drop the Ru. And as you learn verbs, you'll get familiar with uh, how you can identify if it's an Ichidan or Godan verb. Sometimes you just have to look up which one it is and remember that. Um, but again, uh, the main thing I wanted to show you, it's not so much to remember how to conjugate to these different forms because we're not talking about these different forms in detail yet. And we even skipped a few. The important thing is to recognize these boxes, these rows, and how they can kind of slide between each other, how sounds can get modified. As long as you can understand that, verbs can have the same sound sliding in between, that is important. So when you're learning your hiragana, definitely try and remember, for these ones especially, sa, shi, su, se, so, and ta, chi, su, te, to, remember, that even if the sound is a little different, that they're part of the same set. As long as you remember that, um, then I think when we actually talk about how these verbs work and start conjugating them and talking about what that means, you'll be in a good place. Okay. Uh, the main takeaway for this lesson, though, before anything else, I want you to know is this stuff, the logical tree of a sentence and how to use wa correctly. So going back, one more time over this. The logical trio is A ga C O D ni B. Right? A is the subject, marked with ga. C is the object, marked with O. D is the target, marked with ni. And then B is some kind of action. So as long as you understand that every Japanese sentence in some form is a ga b and then you might have these c o or d ni adding information to the sentence then you'll be in good shape going forward as we look at some sentences to figure out what's happening okay so it's a little heavier of a lesson uh, especially not helped by the fact that your vocabulary is not particularly great and um, I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you without having taught you the words that go into them. But the reason I'm doing this is because, one, I think you can handle it. But also, uh, if we start with a good base and we're familiar with the structure of a sentence, then when I start showing you sentences where the intention is for you to learn the vocabulary, you'll be in a good place to understand what the role of the word is in the sentence and what these particles like ga, o, ni, and some of the other ones we talked about last lesson, like to, are doing in the sentence. And you can just focus on the words themselves going forward. Okay, so uh, sorry for the technical issues. Hopefully it was fine at the end. Maybe the archive is unaffected, even if the stream buffered a bunch. Uh, I'll fiddle around some more with this afterwards to see what I can do to improve that. Uh, let me know definitely if the lack of romaji and lack of, you know, uh, or using so much kanji was difficult for you, or if you were still able to get the ideas behind the lesson, despite all that. Um, and then, yeah, uh, thanks for coming. And then tomorrow, Let's see, we'll probably do some more vocabulary stuff that's relatively easy. So we can talk about dates, times, numbers, uh, again, that kind of thing. That should be simple. All right. So, all right.